And we're back. Another episode of Iron Culture, the podcast. Um, all I got to say is, wow, it's been almost five months, and I'm looking forward to eternity with you, Eric. Um, Man, mainly because I can't even believe it's been just, well, not just, I can't believe it's been five months. No. It's time flies when you're, when you're Probably. coasting towards eternity. <laughs> when you're just... So. For, for those that are unaware, we basically joined a cult prior to, you know, people talk about Scientology and that's cool, whatever, but that's so like 1990s, mm -hmm. that's so Tom Cruise. Um, we're on the Paimon uh, train from Hereditary for those that are not down with the seventh circle of hell. You probably got to research that, but we joined a cult and then we started a podcast and slowly we're indoctrinating everyone. We're, we're hipping you with science and with knowledge and whatever, the social, historical, cultural look at lifting. That's kind of like, that's on the outside what you see. Um, it's like Herbalife. Yeah. Like Herbalife, sure, they they market you on weight loss or your health, but really it's about joining a family. And I would interchange, Eric, family and cult for Iron Culture. We're, we're, we joined a cult, and we're trying to indoctrinate others in said cult. I mean, if people haven't picked up on what the first four letters of culture are, then they're just missing something, aren't they? <laughs> like, we threw it right there. You know when there's that M. Night Shyamalan mm -hmm. twist that by now only – unless they really want to subvert expectations the director it's like come on in the first 10 minutes i'm like the hero dies i yeah i figured this one out so i've got a pitch for hollywood here and i Go. know we have some directors listening yeah All right, i want one. you to envision dark dusty library <laughs> new york all right <laughs> okay it's, it's 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 the uh some heritage library it's made up it doesn't matter and we've got tom hanks okay <laughs> okay Tom Hanks is in a special area room, um, and he gets a text from his hacker assistant. Uh, plucky, comedic relief uh, <laughs> gives him a text, and he says, Hey, I just found out uh, that the Cayman Island uh, accounts are linked to Iron Culture. Wow. And he pulls out this book and opens it and he's looking at these records of how long iron culture goes back and he's like what the heck and he finds that there's a, re a registration as a, for a business way back when the mayflower came and it's not iron culture it's iron cult, cult. and he tries to rub it away and then he looks around at the, at the camera <laughs> with the wide eyes and realizes this whole time that we've actually been carrying on a, uh, a Salem-based witch cult from the 1600s through a podcast, and we're trying to subvert the lifting community to become Satan worshippers. Wow, I mean, it's like the Da Vinci Code, but actually good. I'm in. Um, I Hollywood, call us. We're right here. Now, we're not going anywhere. One demand, Eric. We need yes. a co-star in our own film. Okay, we're not getting this. Ain't a Tom Cruise. Tom, like you said, Tom Hanks to be, uh, you know, humble. To imply that, yeah, we would get someone like Tom Hanks. No, nah, it's us. Okay, they need the chemistry. I want to have the, uh, the, the Stan after Lee us. appearance. Don't. Or, or don't point it out so Brandon can actually remove that from the audio, but now he can't. <laughs> um, I want to have my my appearance like Stan Lee. Just like I want to be like the security guard as he walks down. Like, hey, what, where are you going? He's like, no, I'm going down to read the book. All right. And then everyone's like, hey, that's, that's Eric Helms. That's Eric. Yeah. He looks so conditioned. He's so shredded. You're going to make it a point, Eric. You're, it's like Bruce Lee style. Where unfortunately, I'm going to say, knock on wood, where uh, he was prepping for a movie and he's trying to manipulate his sodium, I heard, is one of the uh, ways that he slipped into the coma. But you're going to try and get so diced and you're going to write it in that you walk shirtless in the library. People's like, damn, that's like, that's like a Grecian statue right there. Who is that? And you're going to be the focus of the movie instead of Tom Hanks and Iron Cult or whatever. Uh, like like Lou Ferrigno's appearance in the Hulk, where he's like the Jack security guard, and like, oh wow, that security guard is <laughs> yeah. really really lifts. Yeah. Yeah. Good God, who is that guy? <laughs> Just stealing yeah. thunder, and that's why um you know, from <clears throat> myself, from my own Hollywood breakout movie. Yeah, it's yeah, good. it's it's meta. You're stealing your own thunder within your own mm -hmm. story that actually is about real life, and we're trying to talk about what is happening but then we're trying to joke about it so people don't realize the encroaching darkness and uh what i mean when i say that is that's why eric i basically i skip around i dance around when people say hey omar like where are you from how old are you and they think i'm just like kind of be uh trying to be coy and joke but it's actually because i'm three thousand years old and we've been at this game for a long time okay 
talking about staying motivated through uh, <laughs> through the ages with with fitness. I love it. Yeah, and uh, and that's what we're about here at Iron Culture. Iron so. Culture. That should be honestly. I'm not trying to pimp our uh, listeners, but you know we will have some merchandise because this uh, podcast we love doing it, and I, I mean that sincerely. That this has helped refocus honestly my lifting in the direction and longevity. Uh, doing this with you, Eric. Mm. Uh, but we got to pimp our listeners, and we will eventually have a shirt. Maybe I'll say not uh, Aaron Colt, sure, you know, with a hyphen. I like it. I'm, yeah. I wouldn't, I mean, I don't know how, how I guess we have kind of come out with it now in this episode. We're not really hiding it very well. Tom no. Hanks doesn't even need to do his job, <laughs> no, really. Yeah. yeah. yeah we've We're already... just really bad secret cult leaders. Oh, but that's any cult. You know, like, it's like Fight Club where it's like, you don't, you don't talk about Fight Club, you know, but everyone does. But the That's whole right. reason you joined Fight Club is because it's so interesting. You want to talk about it. Like, you sit there in the doctor's office, you know, and you're like, what are you here for? Oh, I have stage four cancer. You know, yeah, and did you notice this bruise in my eye? <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you where I got it. But, you know, if you're getting tired of not fighting while you're dying of cancer and you want to express yourself, I know something that I can't talk about that I really want to talk about. Iron Cole. Oh, sure. Yeah, exactly. And- we're going to see how well Eric does in this episode today because we have a monster episode. Honestly, we've been, you know, uh, chit-chatting for the last five, six minutes, just bantering a bit. But I've been trying to loosen Sir Eric Alp, Koth, as he's known. Um, because, loose. yeah, we're going to, Lucy Goosey, we're going to take a look now at your thesis that you did for your PhD, which, interestingly enough, ties together with a previous conversation we had, which I think is episode four, a periodization roundtable. Uh, Mike Zordos, uh, Mike Tashir, uh, John Kiley, which mm-hmm. people this this can serve. What would you say, Eric? Um, not as an introduction, a complimentary. It's 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 both. I would say it really it would uh, complement that discussion as well as give a great background to auto regulation. Yeah, that's, that's 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 the hope, right? I think um, that that's that was really kind of the whole experience for me of doing the PhD it was just a deep dive into the concept of of auto regulation and then. Once I did that kind of big picture deep dive, and then really honing in on a specific application of it. So, yeah, hopefully that we can um, we can bring that to our listeners to better understand it through my experience. Yeah, and I, th- <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna assume that was a French accent, but I'm also gonna excuse the prep. Um, no, I, I just I, I just <laughs> lost control of my tongue. <laughs> 1,200 yeah, calories like, a day will do that to you. Eric. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay, so. It is going to be fascinating because I had a chance to look over uh, Eric's thesis, which is available online. And in fact, we will link it in the description. But the second part of this conversation will not only be talking about Eric's thesis, but the process of furthering your education in this form, uh, you getting that uh, thesis and what it looks like, what it takes. Because I think there is that difference in speaking from someone who is a Google scholar, um, you know, who has spent (laughs) some time on the interwebs. People will briefly educate themselves on some topics, maybe read some books, right? Like I read uh, uh, The Pyramids, uh, you know, Stronger by Science is a great resource and you think you're well educated and then you see actual practitioners that are in the field trying to do then research or they're uh, trying to further their education, the amount of work that it uh, uh, really takes. Like how many how many references did you have uh, at the back there, Eric? It was, it was like 10 pages worth. Yeah, something like that. I mean, it, it's... Uh, I think I also don't like the the positioning of saying, hey, like you think you're educated, but a PhD, it's a whole nother level no. like it is. But it's also an absolutely unnecessary level for someone who wants to, um, let's say, be a personal trainer right. um, or or someone who wants to know how to how to lift. Um, I think like. Sure, I, I, I appreciate the respect you're throwing on on the PhD and it is a, a you know, it's. Fuck, it's a, it's a three-year research project. So it's if it doesn't have a triple-digit number of references, then then did you even do a three-year <laughs> research project? You yeah. Know? yeah. What have you been reading? You know? So, yeah. So classic Eric being humble, shitting on his PhD before we get into it. <laughs> Let's, it's like, it's not <laughs> necessary for most people. Let me ask you then, uh, because the title, my phone is uh, behind me, Eric. The title of your... A uh, thesis is incredible. You memorized it, so go ahead. You yes, got it. right. It. So it's uh, called 
auto regulation what's the dealio good or bad and he did say dealio which is the first ever use in academic circles of dealio or dealio depending upon uh who you hang out with it is oh mm. man it's <laughs> so obviously it's using the repetitions and reserve based rating of perceived exertion scale to auto regulate powerlifting training boom see yeah <laughs> just it, and 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 to be 100 percent clear for the listeners i had to look it up to remember it because <laughs> uh that's just not the thing that sticks out in my mind oh eric you know? it flows off the tongue come on let's be honest here um yeah it's it's like mbop it just mm-bop. kind of natural yeah. So let's get into this now. Let's talk about auto regulation and let's and I, what I like too in, in your thesis, you give the definitions, right? Uh, so mm-hmm. you talk about auto regulation, you talk about RP, who kind of started when it comes to powerlifting training, RP. Let's let's first break down the question: What made you want to pursue this particular topic? Absolutely. So when I first decided to continue my education. Um, I had done a, a bachelor's and my, my master's through uh, California University of Pennsylvania, which is funny because that's the city of California in Pennsylvania. It had uh, a really good, um, I think that the top ranked at the time, this was back when online schools were not as ubiquitous as they are now or online programs, had the top ranked uh, fitness specific online programs. Uh, to get into them, you had to be a personal trainer currently working at least 20 hours uh you'd write a little letter of application i did my bachelor's um while i was working full-time as a trainer um actually wrote the business plan for 3dmj in my sports econ class in my undergrad um started it while i was in the midst of my my bachelor's and then i liked it so much that i went out and do my master's there so all coursework in the states while i was living in in sacramento with my wife um and kind of each step of the way i appreciated the 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 understanding the knowledge and the skills it was giving me and the tools i was getting um and at a certain point i realized that i had the confidence to take it further and the big difference between undergrad and grad school where you actually do a thesis is that you're no longer a consumer you become a producer of knowledge and i thought that was really cool but i wasn't going to do it like the whole reason i'm out here is to try to make some kind of positive impact. So my goal uh, was to specifically create research that would influence the practice of, of, of my community, of the lifting community. So I, when I did my, when I came out to New Zealand to do my thesis for my master's and the thesis for my PhD, I was specifically attracted to applied research. Um, so the difference between applied research and mechanistic or basic research is that if there is a I like to teach what's called the the research chain, right? So we have mechanistic based research, which tells us how things work on a fundamental level, level, and then we have applied research, which is not necessarily investigating mechanisms, but is investigating outcomes that are as close as possible to real life while still retaining uh, the control necessary for scientific experimentation. And then that should be one in directly informing the other. And then it goes back down the chain. You know, we have these hypotheses from the field. You know, like the common issues with bro science, for example, are not that the observations are wrong. It's that most commonly the 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 reasons wrong of what they think is happening. Like, yeah, you actually observed that, but no, it's not that. You know, we need to figure out what it is. So then that that thing goes back down the chain. So the example for uh, my master's thesis, which I think is quite cool, is that I put in the introduction, and which is this is totally not not a regulation, but I'll I'll get to your answer your question eventually. Uh, in the introduction, I said, hey, bodybuilders have always observed that uh, when they have a high protein diet, they, they look better and they do better. And um, I think, you know, here, here's why bodybuilders describe that, you know, and say they say we need that much to build muscle. That's clearly not true. We've got a bunch of data that doesn't show that. However, when bodybuilders see the biggest changes in, in their body, it's when they're dieting. And the emerging data we have is that protein might be more important when you're energy restricted, doing concurrent training, dieting. Uh, and to, to maintain lean body mass without losing, you know, uh, while, while losing body fat. So anyway, I kind of said, hey, I'm coming back down, back down the chain here. You know, we from the applied field, bodybuilders eat a lot of protein. Does it actually work? And let's go back up it. So the the idea of, of studying autoregulation uh, came from the field. Um, that is me saying, hey, what, what, what's some cool emerging stuff um, that is getting fleshed out in the lifting community? Uh, and one of those influences of mine was the systems used by Mike Tushier. 
who we had on that 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 uh, auto regulation and periodization roundtable, and he had done some very unique things uh, with manipulating the concept of RPE, which goes way back before him, um, but using it specifically in a powerlifting context and creating an entire system of of, of auto regulating training around it. So that's why I wanted to study it is because it's something that high level lifters were doing in the field seemingly successfully and that from a theoretical practical perspective made a lot of sense, solved some problems and I wanted to then take it back into the lab and say well why, let's describe it, let's see what it does and let's see uh, empirically uh, can we validate certain aspects of it look at how reliable it is, figure out when to use it, why to use it, how to use it, when not to use it, or if perhaps it's not as good as we think and it's just hyped up, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was my motivation to look at autoregulation for my PhD. Yeah, and let's start with some definitions then for just so everyone's on the same page. Autoregulation then, Eric, if you're to try and define what it is, because before Mike to share, I'm, I'm not even sure about this before, <clears throat> the last 12 years, most periodized programs would adhere strictly and exclusively, as far as I'm aware, uh, to percentage-based uh, programming, meaning that you'd have your one rep max, or you can have uh, a daily max or a rough calculator what that one rep max is, and most of your work would be done based off that percentage. And then there was that change gradually with someone like Mike Tuchere talking about RP, rate of perceived exertion, and using RIR, reps in reserve, and then using auto-regulation, how you feel, how that total accumulated fatigue, how your performance feels dictating what you should do and how you should structure your training. Um, so I guess the question should be, first, can you define auto-regulation? And then what, what, what was the bulk of training like before? Was it basically just percentage-based training? So there's always been a disconnect between what is done in exercise science and what is done by lifters. And some of that comes down to a need to create control in the lab setting. So for example, you can find submaximal training going all the way back to training manuals in the, in, in the 40s and 50s and even prior to that. Uh, people doing repetition-based work. Um, I remember reading about the in the Silver Age of uh, of Muscle Beach. We're talking like 40s and 50s. Um, some of the guys at that time, um, when they would plateau, which was in you know would happen because they're high, very high level lifters, they would just stick with the same weight for a month and just keep doing it until it felt easier, and then go up and load. That was one of their progression models, and that implies that they were doing a lot of sets and reps submaximally. Um, However, if you go all the way back to the same time period in the 40s where the DeLorme method of progressive overload was instituted, it was based on the concept of doing a 10RM and then just trying to improve your 10RM over time. So it wasn't that everything was based on a 1RM, it was always based on a maximum. Right. Because how do we control between individuals and make sure that you're actually creating overload if we don't do as many reps that you possibly can in the given context of training? So kind of baked in, uh, before we even understood uh, what happens when you train to failure mechanistically, like a lot of the justifications for training to failure now is, well, how do you know you've achieved uh, complete you know, fiber recruitment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of that came, came later. Um, but going all the way back to the beginning, uh, the rationale was we know that progressive overload is required to get these adaptations. Um, the only way we can ensure that overload is achieved for each person all the time is to ensure maximal effort and that controls for things. So it wasn't typically 1RM testing because a lot of times you'd have a clinical setting, they'd be doing like a leg extension or a leg curl or some kind of modified exercise, but it was always based on some type of RM. So 5RM, 10RM, 15RM, or potentially a 1RM and then a percentage. But the percentage of a 1RM actually came later. Um, so what you see early on is these, uh, these RM-based programs and just progressing either a single set or like the Oxford method, you'd start with it and then back off a little bit and then, or you, you'd, sorry, you'd build up, you'd do like a percentage of your 10 RM is warm up and then you'd do the top set uh, or the opposite of that. So, but in the end, you're always doing your working set to failure at a specific repetition maximum. Um, and then when auto-regulation comes around, that's still occurring. Uh, and the first time you'll see this talked about it, there's a paper by like Knight, 
I think in 1979 or something like that, um, where the the idea is, hey, we don't all progress at the same rate. Um, so we do need to institute progressive overload, but at the rate that someone is ready. And I think it's like a knee rehab program, if I recall correctly, uh, written by Knight. And the idea is that uh, you do a uh, as many reps as possible, essentially, at, at, a, at, a, at a, what was your previous three, six, I think maybe six RM or something like that. And then based on how many reps you get, you increase your load a certain amount next time and you keep doing that. So the faster you're able to progress, the faster you progress, essentially. That's auto regulation, right? Um, so each individual dictates how quickly load is increased. Therefore, you're achieving overload each time you, you train. Um, and this was just kind of a paper that sat out there and, and it might have been used in clinical settings. I don't know. I wasn't a, um, you know, a physical therapist in 1983. So, um, however, then super training comes around. So that's Melsif. Yep. Uh, and he coins the term uh, APRE, Autoregulated Progressive Resistance Exercise, which is taking the original DeLorme method that was then modified by Knight and then is modified by, by SIF to put it into a sports science setting. And he creates uh, the same system, but based around different goals. So he has like a strength, and then he has a muscular endurance and a hypertrophy rep range, but still the same system. And it's essentially a, uh, a four set system where you build up to it, then you do one set to failure, um, and then you do a set, the next set based on what you did on the failure set, and then the, the set the next session based on that the set after that. So now it's become multi-set, there's two sets to failure and it's auto-regulated, but it's still to failure all the time. And this was, you know, I think super training was written in the late nineties initially, if I recall correctly. Um, and then this kind of just sat around. It didn't really appear in the academic research at all. Um, and you really don't see anything about auto-regulation until uh, 2010 in the peer reviewed literature. Um, this we're talking now, again, the separation between uh, practice and what is occurring in, in science. Uh, when uh, Mann wrote about in 2010, basically did a study on the MELSIF modifi modified system of APRE, and he did it in uh, NCAA football players, and he had a retrospective analysis compared to when they did a traditional linear periodization model uh, compared to a season of training with APRE, and they got stronger doing APRE. Um, and that's the first time you really see autoregulation appear in the literature, and it's defined as a system uh, which allows you to adapt at an individualized pace to optimize it, you know, your progress. So that's the research. So you know, it's still stuck with kind of this going to failure concept, um, and it's taken a while to to, to kind of uh, penetrate sports science and then actual strength conditioning research and, and applied practice. Um, and it's all still based on the original DeLorme concept of overload having to be training to failure to standardize things. So that's kind of where, it, where it's come from. Now, if we ignore all that and we look in the, the powerlifting world and the bodybuilding world, yeah, there, there's um, a, basically a war between uh, maximum intensity and then volume and going submaximal to allow you to do more volume. And then what matters, which one's more important, um, and this really starts to become much more uh, distinct when you get into the kind of the Nautilus era and the emergence of, of Mike Menser oh, yeah. um, and, and the kind of the, the high intensity crew, high intensity, high intensity training versus kind of your traditional training. Dorian um, Yates. Yeah. And, you know, Dorian was even, I would say was even less extreme. Like right. he actually did multiple sets and a few, few sets leading up to a set at failure. But he definitely had the same philosophy. Like if you plateau, you have to figure out another way to do uh, more more intense work. Um, so anyway, so, but but, there, but there's always been these camps of people who see the value in not training to failure. You know, you've got Lee Haney saying stimulate, don't annihilate. You know, you've got um, Dave Draper, Arnold Schwarzenegger training 15 to 25 sets per muscle group two times per week, which is oddly enough totally lines up with what we do today. <laughs> You know, did not hear Eric also uh, Serge Nubre sometimes was it not uh, people joke now about that eight hour uh, arm workout that like Rich Piana mentioned, but I thought I remember reading that Serge Nubre would spend hours in the gym, basically not training to failure, but doing multiple sets of very high volume work. I'm not sure if that uh, lines up to it's, cer it's certainly possible no. that 
I think I think more instructive. It, it, like there's always those weird standouts because you know bodybuilders are weird people. And you'll <laughs> find them, you know, yeah. silly things that are done. But like if you looked at what were the overall cultural trends, um, you had a period where there's a lot of people doing one set once per week to absolute failure, pushed as hard as they possibly could. Um, less common, but but it was you know it, it was growing and it's still sort of around. And the single set system is incredibly effective in the general population. Like it gets you a solid, you know, 50% of, of, the, of, the, of the maximum progress you can make off a single set. And I think that's something that people forget, you know, like what is optimal for a bodybuilder is unreasonable and likely to be adhered to for an individual. And the most efficient way is, is to do a low volume, high intensity program. Uh, that's what I would recommend to the average person who's looking for, I can only train two hours a week. Like, all right, let's go through that circuit and do one set to failure, like true failure, yep. and and that'll maximize your time. But anyway, if you look at kind of the dominant trends of what people did, you have these kind of changing eras. Like in the 40s and 50s, people were doing upper, lower, and full body splits using compound movements. Uh, and then with the emergence of anabolics, machines, um, and, and marketing becoming much more popular, everything kind of gets muddied, and that's when you start seeing a lot more different philosophies. Um, and, uh, and then there's also the, the cultural splits in bodybuilding between, um, does function follow form or does form follow function? Um, and the creation of IFBB, which says, no, we want to be pure bodybuilders versus kind of the war with the AAU that says, Hey, bodybuilding is an extension of, of lifting. Um, and we're appreciating what the body can do by via its form. Um, and so then training systems develop differently there. You know, the importance of maintaining strength is kept in kind of the AAU communities, the John Grimmicks, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, a lot of the, the IFBB, IFBB camp is talking about, you know, specific training for hypertrophy. And they'd stop listening to one another and, you know, stereotype each other and characterize. So they, they both get worse because of that. Um, and anyway, so we see the, but the point being is that since the, the, the 40s, over the last, you know, 80 years now, uh, almost, we, we've got people training not to failure and seeing the utility in it. And, 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 and it's part of the bodybuilding community, whether it's dominant in different times or not. And amazing physiques have been built with it. But in the research, there's this assumption that unless you're training for power, you know, which is maximizing velocity, uh, you know, plyometrics or ballistic barbell training or throwing things or, or uh, you know, explosive lifting where you stop well short of failure with, with moderate to light loads, uh, you're training to failure because that's that's just what you do, um, and that's how we standardize things. So the the first time you start to see this the system of dictating how far from failure you are is Mike Tushier, and he wrote the Reactive Training Manual in 2008 uh, that was all about using RPE, and RPE is something that undergraduate exercise science students get get exposed to very early. Um, but that the lay public is not familiar with, again, the disconnect between science and practice. So there's a whole community of power lifters who, when you say RPE, they immediately think, oh, we're dictating how far from failure we are. Um, but in the, 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 the research domain, if you say RPE, it's either a 6 to 20 or a 1 to 10 scale that is just purely based on subjective difficulty. Um, so this was created, and stop me at any point, so I don't just do this massive historical RPE thing. I've been loving it. I mean, it's like, all right, yeah. You're on no the one's listening except for Omar. And <laughs> yeah. I'm good with it. You, me, and Tom Hanks. Who, <laughs> as soon as we mention his name, he's undercover. And hey, I just want to say we have uh, now, after about three months, we're averaging between ten to fifteen thousand downloads an episode. So it's possible okay it is possible tom's listening and he's hooked and ever since you mentioned his name he is just writing down notes he's so it's it. you me and tom bro i think probably more likely is the narcissism in this episode <laughs> is going to take us from 10 back down to three as i do a monologue about uh the history of rpe and, and research no the, the um, importance of your particular research and how it's shaping specifically shape it, yeah. specifically and how important i am yes yeah i love i so, love the master's drop where you're like it was actually really good which uh let the record reflect that thing could make another great duo episode. But anyways, go on. Yeah, that's what people want to hear is uh, is basically my, my, my thesis defense every 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 Monday. Oh, yeah. I think that's what people want. I'm sending your ass back. I'm just giving the people what they want. Eric, I'm sending your ass back to school after this just so we have more episodes in the tank. I will do a, a PhD a week. 
for yeah. you, Omar. <laughs> just, yeah. I was thinking Worst of a, a bachelor of, of all time, a bachelor of arts, something like that. You know, I was thinking like, just changing yeah, yeah. it up a bit. Ain't nothing wrong with the VA. Yeah, yeah. So expressive all dance right. next episode. So auto regulation, Mike Tashir, yes, two thousand and eight ish, where he took it, it's what it's called the a Borg scale. Um, and then he was trying to structure that around powerlifting and using rate of perceived exertion, RPE, to quantify how one feels in relation to the weight they're lifting. Exactly. So the, the, so the original researcher back in 1970 uh, was Gunnar Borg, and he created the Borg RPE scale. So that's just the rating of perceived exertion scale. The original scale was 6 to 20. And I always, when I teach this class, I, I randomly ask someone in the room, how hard, how hard, how hard is life right now? 6 to 20. And, they, and everyone laughs. And I go, yeah, why would someone use 6 to 20? Isn't that super arbitrary? Um, but it was meant to line up with resting heart rate all the way up to max heart rate. So 60 to 200. That's kind of roughly average. And he was actually able to validate that as heart rate goes up on a treadmill, so does RPE. And they're very closely linked. Um, and for general exertion tasks and general exercise, when you care about global fatigue, RPE, RPE has been validated and revalidated and validated again and again and again and again, and it mirrors all kinds of physiological markers. And it's a really cool way of saying, hey, this complex system of being a human and all of our different sensory uh, inputs uh, is able to give you probably the best picture of your current status of, of fatigue uh, by just your perception of exertion. Um, and in even modern systematic reviews where we compare uh, blood markers or heart rate markers or all these different physiological variables, they're typically less representative of the training load and the uh, amount of uh, and the physiological outcomes, um, real performance than individual markers, which only give us kind of one window onto the global perspective. So a validated questionnaire um, of, of how you're feeling and validated is a really important caveat there is the best tool we have now, even in 2019, with all the, the technology and stuff we have. So anyway, um, so the Borg scale, created in 1970, started the 6 to 20. Uh, originally, then they made a, an easier to use 1 to 10 scale, because 6 to 20 is nice, but as you age, your heart rate changes, and there's individual differences. And if you train the heart rate, you'll get two changes. So it doesn't apply to everyone. So they went to, a, you know, I think a 1 to 10 scale, and then they created other scales like the Omni scale, which has a visual component, which is useful for children who who can't read or um, someone who is uh, in certain populations, it's, it's better to be using, using that scale. But various different iterations of the same thing, the Borg RPE scale. Um, now, the thing with the Borg RPE scale is that if you give someone a novel task, it is not necessarily as accurate. And this comes down to what's called anchoring. The if you were just to have someone say do something that everyone does, like run, walk on a treadmill or run on a treadmill or, or, or do that until it's very difficult, everyone has a concept of how hard that might be because they ran as a child or, or the vast majority of people do. However, if you expose someone to resistance training and they've never done it before and you say have them do a 10RM, let's say that, um, it is really common and actually been shown in three studies that I'm aware of that they might call that anywhere from a 6 to a 9 RPE out of 10. So you've gone to failure. You literally couldn't have done another rep. There's nothing more you could have done in the context of that exercise, but it wasn't maximal, even though you maxed it out. Powerlifter right now is scratching their head and going, what's wrong with people? This is dumb. <laughs> the person doing it, let's say they were a U.S. Marine. Yeah. They just did a 6RM. They're like, no, a crude, the crucible was a, was a 10. Yeah. That was a 6. Yeah. It was 6. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I couldn't have done another rep, but how hard was it? Was my level of exertion? Not that 6. High. Yeah. 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 So that is a, a consistent finding. Um, and the reason is, is that they weren't anchored to it. Now, if you'd had a familiarization session with that Marine and you said, all right, we're going to do a 6RM. Now you couldn't do another rep. That's what we call a 10. He goes, okay, cool. And now everything gets scaled to that anchor. Now I know that 6RM is a 10 RPE in that context. And now Borg RPE is good. Unfortunately, that means that you have to do that familiarization session. You have to build that skill and you have to build that into your research design. And that's just not something that people typically do. Uh, it takes more time and, and then it requires building that skill. However, in the context of lifters, especially competitive power lifters, who their whole goal is to get as close to their maximal attempt as they can on the platform on three lifts uh, so that they get the highest total um, and they're training heavy, um, and especially also in bodybuilders who are very frequently training to failure, or at least it's a part of their program in some way, 
um, they are quite familiar with what it's like to go to failure. And if you tell them uh, that this is a 10 RPE, they'd be fine. Um, so what Mike T does, he comes around now we're 40 years later almost, or just shy of it, 2007, 2008, somewhere around there. You know, Mike T is starting to, to coach powerlifters, emerge in the powerlifting scene as a very dominant power for himself, becoming a thought leader. Um, and he creates a system of auto-regulation based around the concept of using RPE, specifically based on how far from failure you are. And his original scale is also used at lower RPE. It's like how fast the bar moved and how difficult it was. But there is a component, especially at higher RPEs, around how many more reps do you think you could get. 10 is you couldn't have done more reps, couldn't have done more load. That was your max. A 9 is you could have done one more. And an 8 was you could do two more. And then it, the, the, the different, different types of the scale changed over time. He refined it. But it became universally understood as a metric of explaining how far from failure you are primarily, especially at higher RPEs. And this was easily adopted by powerlifters because that was intuitive, something they, that was, they had anchored before, they understood it. Uh, and a single at a seven meant something, a single at an eight meant something. Um, and they knew that you know the third attempt would be a 10, second attempt probably a nine, and the first attempt would be an eight. That's kind of how you set things up, right? And, you know, building strength occurs and doing, you know, a five by five where your first set's at an eight. So you can actually get your fifth set, you know, and if you're in uh, a peaking block, you're probably going to start around seven RPEs and you're going to build up till you hit nines and you're going to taper and you're going to get on the platform and hit those tens. Kind of these, these things that powerlifters are already doing uh, now allows them uh, to, to actually ensure that it's occurring instead of having some of the variability that it happens with percentage one RM. So... That, that's kind of where it all stemmed from. And it stemmed from the issues in the research realm. Why I thought it was worth studying was because either we're always training to failure, right? Or we're using percentage 1RMs, which have problems. So the percentage 1RM issue has been demonstrated a number of times. Like if you look at, there's a study where they took endurance athletes and strength athletes and had them go to failure at 80% of 1RM on a leg press. Yes. And there was like a three-fold difference or two-fold difference in the number of reps they could get. Like between, yeah, the low end was six and then the high was 24 or something? Well, that's actually a more recent study that oh, we sorry. did. And, th and this isn't even comparing endurance athlete and strength athletes. So we took uh, a bunch of college-aged males who could at least squat one and a half times body weight. So now we've got a really homogenous sample, not right. endurance athletes and strength athletes, and had them work up to a 1RM on squat, loaded 70% on the bar, covered the plates so they couldn't see what it was and then had them do an AMRAP to failure. And in two different studies, we got as far as, I think the, the biggest range we ever saw was six to 26 and the other one was nine to 20. But the point is it's, it's huge. There are some people who the standard prescription of a hypertrophy day of three by eight at 70% literally couldn't do it. And there's other people who would be feeling like they did three easy warm up sets. Uh, and we would know that that would probably produce different adaptations being that far from failure. So that's not ideal. So that's why you get wild. That's one of the many reasons, actually, you can get wildly different results uh, from two different people on the same percentage-based program, even though a percentage is supposed to auto-regulate you uh, because, you know, as you get stronger, it's still the same relative load. But the, the problem is, is that different people can do different reps at different percentages. And it does narrow the higher the percentage gets. Like once you get to 85%, 90%, it's going to be very similar. So it's not a huge issue in powerlifting. Um, but it is definitely an issue when you start doing uh, volume-based work or rep work. Um, and more importantly, you're, it, it, that, that's between individuals. Within individuals, your performance changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, for example, uh, if you were to come into the gym and just do a, uh, a maximal jump height to see how high you could jump, you would have probably, with an average training program and the kind of variation you have in sleep and nutrition and all that stuff, you're gonna get maybe a one, two, or 3% difference every day on how many, say, centimeters high you can jump. And how high you can jump mirrors and reflects, and we've done data on this as well, how heavy you can squat. It makes sense, you know, if you took a bar off someone's back while they're squatting a 1RM, they would leap into the air, right? Because they're maximally exerting themselves, they just can't go very quickly because there's 200 kilos on their back. So that means that on a day-to-day -day basis for a myriad of reasons, your strength is not the same. So if we give you 90% of 1RM at a single, some days you'll get crushed and some days you can get four reps. And that's kind of, that's just the, the way it goes. Uh, and if you're in a really hard overreaching block, that could be even more wildly variant, you know? Or let's say you're dieting, 
Or let's say you're you're cutting weight for powerlifting meat. You know, all these different things can affect you. Let's say you're three um, weeks out from a show and uh, you're on twelve hundred calories a day. Absolutely, yeah. So that's another place that I really like the use of auto regulation, and I huh. I uh, didn't talk about it much in my thesis because it was powerlifting specific. But using RPE during prep is a great way to to modulate the energy highs and lows. So th this is something that I thought was really interesting, um, and it has allowed. Anecdotally, at the, we're talking 2008 to say 2013 before I started actually doing my research. Anecdotally, a lot of powerlifters would report that it was helping them improve their training performance. Um, and that is what all led in total to me contacting Mike T in 2011 or 12, uh, or I guess no, 2013, um, Skyping with him and him saying, yeah, man, study this shit. And if it doesn't show it's good, publish it. Like I want to improve it. And I was really respected as intellectual honesty, as curiosity, and just the way he was a thinker. Um, and also led me to meeting Mike Zerdos at an RTS seminar in Sydney, where Zerdos was sharing that he was doing the exact same thing in his lab. They were validating the scale. Uh, and it just so happened to be one of those things where we met each other. We were wanted to study the same thing, starting to study the same thing in his case. And I brought him on as a PhD supervisor, my tertiary supervisor. And thank God we met, or we would have been replicating a lot of the same work. Because um, he was a close friend of Mike T. Uh, I was, and that's kind of how we met each other. And then all of a sudden, it became this uh, this partnership between Zerdos and I and my team here at AUT and his team at FAU. And we've been producing uh, most of the, the modern uh, RPE-based research. Of course, there was a lot that also came out of uh, Sydney, led by uh, uh, Hackett and colleagues. They, they did a, a lot of looking at it. I think unaware and independent of Mike T in 2012, they just simply had a comparison between Borg RPE and bodybuilders just going to failure and then estimating repetitions to failure, what they call ERF, just how far from failure you are. So it's, you don't need to convert, you know, a nine is one rep, eight is two rep left. So they would just say, yeah, I could, I could do two more. So they'd be doing bench press and at lockout, they go, I could do two more. And then they would see if they could do two more, getting motivated by the team. Uh, and then they randomized one group to do a Borg RPE and the other group to do uh, estimated reps to failure. And they found that bodybuilders were really good at estimating reps to failure, especially the closer they got to failure and with multiple sets as the fatigue set on and they had to do less total reps. So the light at the end of the tunnel is closer. And they found that it was more accurate, at least the relationship was stronger with estimated reps to failure, with actual reps to failure than Borg RPE was. So the, it's, the, the rationale is built in the literature. We find the study by Hackett. Then Zerdos and I validate uh, RPE uh, in a study published, it was published a while later, but conducted in 2013 or 2012, um, where we used the velocity with people going to failure on AMRAPs and building up to a 1RM and found that velocity was inverse to RPE, which makes sense. The closer you get to failure, the slower the bar moves. So we, we validated the ability of, of assessing load with RPE. Um, Hackett has validated the idea that train lifters, bodybuilders specifically, are better at estimating repetitions to failure, and it, that's more representative of actual repetitions to failure than Borg RPE. And then we've got in the field, Mike T uh, taking high-level lifters and making them even more high-level, and himself being at the time, arguably one of the best American IPF lifters there are, using the RPE system. So we know it's at least not preventing high-level performance in yes. powerlifting. Like, like if we want to use anecdote, it's the most you know rational, limit, limiting definition. So we've got this theoretical rationale of, hey, this is something worth studying. And that is what basically kicked off. That was my proposal in, in a nutshell of what I gave for my PhD that got approved before I started collecting data. And so you've given now, Eric, the history of basically percentage-based training or RP, even if it didn't have a label, starting all the way from the 1940s, and then bringing it up to the introduction for you of hearing about Mike Tashir and then meeting up with Mike Zordos, where I read in the thesis that he was a tertiary advisor. But also, I wonder, it's kind of a funny aside, how you convinced him, considering that he already was beginning the research, where you're like, I want to do my PhD on this. It's like, dog, like, stop what you're doing. I'm going to do this. It's my thing now. And P.S. You're going to be like a supervisor for me instead. Um, you know, <laughs> well, that's an interesting thing. So you Kanye so, him. He was like, he was Tay Swift accepting the award. And you're like, I'm gonna let you finish. <laughs> but I'm about to take over this thing. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing, it worked out really well for for FAU is too, because 
And that goes to the whole reason why I'm in New Zealand. Yeah. So in 2011, when I started, the, when I decided, you know what, I want to contribute to the research and get out there and do applied research. I was looking for PhD programs in applied sports nutrition or applied strength conditioning. And there are myriad SNC master's programs in the States, but there are basically no PhDs or there's a couple like you, you there's a ETSU, you know, where Mike is Rattel went, uh, where they embed you with a team or with a group of athletes and you do a PhD that's in, in true sports science, but sports science programs typically stop at like the applied sports science, stop at the master's level in, uh, in the States that's changing. Um, but it's really uncommon to find PhDs, uh, at that level. And that's just kind of, uh, the focus of, of the U S is much more on NIH funding, obesity, et cetera. And where you see the PhDs in sports science and strong sports science, again, this is changing, but if we go back, say to mid two thousands through, uh, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, um, the English, like yeah, English Institute of Sport, Australian Institute of Sport, high performance sport in New Zealand, uh, the sports science being done that was cutting edge was not in the U.S. It's Australia, England. It's in in the English system, and that's because they have um, a little more top down management of high performance sport. Like um, yeah, we've got like the Olympic Training Center, um, but for the most part in the states, you have fragmented individual entities. That are, that are making athletes. And when we have a huge university system, universities are totally different in other countries. There aren't, there's no college sport, you know? So the millions and millions of dollars that get funneled through the universities that turn them into these cities, uh, there's those college campuses, those huge stadiums, and that, that, that kind of money does just not exist. Um, universities are much more pure about knowledge and, and, and the pursuit of it. And sport is not, uh, sports science isn't derived from uh, what's needed at, at the university level. And there's actually a big division between like exercise physiology at big NCAA schools. Like they typically don't even get to touch those athletes. Like, no, 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 you, you don't get to touch the sports car. Go, go play with your undergrad students, you know? So there's this whole problematic issue that we could spend a lot of time talking about of sports science being title of this coach is Eric Helms anti-american american is what it's going to be called where you're like the yes the, that's it, that's the takeaway no, I, that's, that, so, that's what you, I, I hate america is what you're getting from us, yes. what i uh, didn't know which is interesting where you said that that there basically aren't uh, phd programs or that also mm -hmm. that uh, there isn't that separation there where you have all these high level athletes but you can't even then study them um yeah in america but sorry go on yeah, and that, that is changing, and it's not yeah. ubiquitous. Like, like some people I, I know are specifically like, that's not true. We Our sports science program directly informs our, our athletes, and that is definitely the case in some places, but it's not the norm, um, just to put it out there to all, anyone listening. So the, the systems where they have strong sports science coming out uh, at the time of when I was applying were places like Edith Cowan in Perth uh, or 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 Auckland University of Technology here in, 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 in New Zealand where I came. So when I was looking for a, a program to do my PhD and I realized, hold on, I have 3DMJ, I'm an online coach, I can live anywhere. Uh, the choice to go overseas became very obvious, very exciting too. It's a cool, cool way to experience the rest of the world and I've done a lot of travel since. So, you know, moved my family, my wife and I and our two cats to, to New Zealand. We love it here, we're staying here. And I'm studying here because I have the ability to access athletes, coaches, and there's this synergy between sports science and actual strength conditioning and applied sport. It's much closer. Sure, you get arguments between s &C coaches and, and coaches, and, and you get the, the grumbling in, in the academic community that, oh, no one takes our stuff up, but I just kind of sit back and I go, you have no idea how bad it could be. This is, this is great, you know? Um, like, for example, I work in a building uh, called AUT Millennium. And the top floor is the, the main office of High Performance Sport in New Zealand, the government organization that helps high performance sport and tries to get us doing better at the Olympics and, and fostering athletes all the way from a young age to, to older and, and all that stuff. And it's very holistic. Uh, it incorporates physiotherapy. It incorporates uh, an entire team of support from uh, recovery, travel, nutrition, strength conditioning. And the bottom floor is the National Training Center uh, for the high, like the carded athletes, the best athletes in New Zealand, uh, for certain sports who come there and train with the strength conditioning team at High Performance Sport New Zealand, and the mo like more than half of those um, High Performance Sport New Zealand strength conditioning uh, coaches 
have gone through the master's degree and a bunch of them are alumni of AUT. And then we're just two floors up from the, the, uh, the, the training floor and one floor down from the main offices. And we have meetings and, and uh, interactions with the, the SNC coaches all the time. Uh, and they're, they're sharing information. They give us scholarships. Uh, we have people who work while they're doing their PhD with high performance sport in New Zealand and other national sporting bodies. And that's the whole, like that, that's just a very, very unique uh, situation that only happens in a few places in the States and is quite uncommon on the whole. So anyway, that's why I'm out there. And so when I contact, uh, when I meet Zerdos, he doesn't have a PhD program. He's only got master's students. So he's got, you know, these limited size theses that he can do. And when I tell him, hey, I want to spend three years doing research on uh, this thing you're validating right now as a side project that's not actually part of anyone's uh, master's at the moment, he he thinks it's a great idea and he jumps at the chance and it allows him to get more work done. Uh, and since then, I've been on the committee of uh, I think five of his of his students, you know. So and and we've collaborated on a bunch of publications and it was really a win win for us. So um, so if anything, he was the uh, the Jay Z to my Kanye who oh. got me noticed and on the rock. So I, I think I think all respect is. It goes back to uh, to Zerdos. I literally couldn't have done um, my PhD without going out and collecting data at FAU for my big training study because he had actually a lab dedicated to this sort of thing set up while I'm working in a lab at AUT that is serving nearly 100 uh, students in total at AUT who are doing master's or PhD projects across 30 different sports, you know. So our lab is set up to service that many people, and it's very difficult for me to say get... Uh, for eight weeks straight, you know, two groups of, of, of 10 plus lifters in the lab using it all times. Uh, and it takes a very long time to do that kind of research. Most of the time, you know, we're out with a team or embedded with a team or we have these big data collections that come through. So to be able to do kind of one of those, those scaled type of training studies, being able to go to his highly specialized lab and just lock it down for a semester uh, was really, really important uh, and was the only way I could have gotten a high quality training study done. So that was a really, really important meeting I had, or I would have been probably submitting about a year late on my PhD, to be honest. And that's interesting, Eric. Walk us through this process once you've decided what you want to do your thesis on. You have the theoretical framework based on uh, you know individuals that have contributed before. You now have a connection in the form of Mike Zordos where you can have a mm -hmm. uh, place in order to test out the thesis. What is the process from the conception of what you have to carrying out and trying to find out the utility of, you know, auto regulation RP with powerlifters. Where do you go once you have all the stuff set up now, 2013? Right. So to talk about uh, what, what what happens next, I kind of have to give a bit of an, a bit of a, a primer on kind of the structure of a way a PhD works at AUT. Okay. So there are essentially uh, for English speakers that, that I'm aware of, there are two main systems for academia. So there's the, the English system, uh, the European system, which also is used in New Zealand and Australia. And then there is the Canadian and US system, and they're a little bit different. So in, in the US, for example, you have a four year bachelor's and everyone is doing the same thing for the first two years. They're basically getting, you know, a uh, associates of arts or associates of science based on what general ed they take. Um, and then they have two years basically studying their their major right um in the english system there's these three-year bachelors and they you take a, like two or three general ed courses uh and you know because they have a much better education system in high school that, that's typically works out it's fine wow he just um, continues this guy well I'm, yeah you know and you actually get the more specific topics in your last couple of years in high school and stuff like that so anyway <laughs> you you typically do more Students are more prepared once they go to university from, from high school. Uh, and then once they get into university, they have a three-year degree program where almost every class is, is major specific. So more of the course, more of the, the, the specialty topic coursework is front-loaded. Uh, and then you, when you do your master's, it looks pretty similar between, between, the, two, between the two systems. Uh, it's typically a year of coursework and then a year-long thesis if you're doing a thesis-based master's. Uh, but a master's in the English system almost always has a thesis. If you do a 
just the coursework at a master's level, it's typically called a, um, a like a postgraduate diploma or postgraduate certificate, depending on the system. Um, in in the states, though, you can do, and it's very common to do, masters without a thesis. So it's just a master's by coursework, uh, and that's either a professional master's and it ends in exams or in some kind of project, but you don't do research, and it still gives you a master's. It might be a master's of arts, could be a master's of science, and that's what I had. I had the online program. I had a large project, uh, big tests, and I got my master's. However, the, where, where the two systems diverge the most is at the PhD level. So to do a PhD in the English system or the Australian system and that whole, whole way of doing things, it is completely research. So it takes three to four years, uh, you do a proposal, uh, and, and then you're just collecting data. And to get into the PhD, you already have to have research experience, so you must have done a bachelor's with a uh, what's called a dissertation, which is funny. So in the English system, a dissertation is the smallest. In the US system, the dissertation is the largest. That's what you do for your PhD. And then the theses are what you do at the master's and PhD level in the English system. And the thesis is what you do at the master's level in the US system, and then you do a dissertation for your PhD. So anyway, dissertation, thesis, same concept. It's a big research project. Uh, and to get into doing your either PhD dissertation in the States, uh, you've got to get through a bachelor's or a master's, depending on the program. And then to, to shore up the potential that you didn't have research experience going into the PhD and in the US system, you have two to three years of coursework before you then start your actual PhD research. So typically, the research projects and PhDs in the States aren't quite as large as they are in the ones in the English system, just because you're limited by time. But you do take two to three years of higher high level courses. You get stats classes and all that stuff. Well, that's done at the master's level and bachelor's level in, in, in the system I did. So anyway, that is why I had to come out and do a second master's. Um, so that's why my master's is not that impressive. It's, 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 uh, it's just a, like, a, hey, you, you're a remedial educated uh, American who hasn't done research. If you want to do a PhD, you have to do what's called a master's of philosophy. So when I first came out here, I did one, a one-year master's that was just the thesis component. And the MPhil, or the Master's of Philosophy, pretty much exists because of that disconnect for foreign students or for people who have a professional master's, which does exist sometimes, or just a PG dip. It allows them the opportunity to get research experience and then go on to the PhD in the English system. So the all doctorates are technically doctorates of philosophy. So that's what a PhD is, and the, the philosophy of whatever your topic is and whatever your 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 faculty is, right? So I have a, a PhD in strength conditioning, which means I'm a, a doctor of strength conditioning philosophy, and specifically what I studied was RPE. Uh, so the Master's of Philosophy, it sounds weird, but it's the same thing. It's just the thesis-only Master's, and I did that on, on protein intake and, and bodybuilders. But anyway, so to get back to your original question, how did I frame this all up? Uh, with the PhD, I've got myself set up and I've got this, this three-year time, time period up to four years if I want to go over a little bit and pay extra fees to, to answer this, this big picture topic of how can autoregulation improve powerlifting performance. And we have the system that's already out there and we now we want to look at it, validate it, see if we can improve it. So the first thing that we do uh, is we construct a, a proposal for how we're going to do that and it has to get approved and we have to do an ethics uh, approval and get, get everything set up so we can go do this research and it has to make sense and we get external examiners to, to to look at it and say yeah this will answer your question and it'll meet the standard of a PhD. Now at AUT and in some universities uh, they allow you to have a different format of your thesis than what is traditional. So the traditional thesis format or dissertation format is you have an introduction, your literature review, your methods, your results, and your discussion slash conclusion. And this basically says, introduction, here's what I'm doing, why it's important, why it's novel and, novel and how I'm going to do it. Literature review, here's what's already been done, and here are the gaps that I'm going to try to connect or where I'm going to fit in with this research. Methods, here's what I'm actually, here are the tools I'm going to use to answer this question. We make sure they're, they're, they're valid and reliable. Um, results, here's what I found. Here's the actual research I did, and then discussion, here's what they mean. And here's, the, here's how they fit in with things, and here's the conclusion. So it's a five chapter standard uh, thesis. And those chapters are huge, they're long, and they cover three years of work. Uh, they're generally not publishable because um, the, at least in that format, 
because a standard journal article is between three to 5,000 words in, in sports science, right? And that might be your method section, you know? Yeah. So you're not going to have a 5,000 word journal article about your method. So what you have to do is after you've totally burned yourself out and nearly died doing a PhD is then create journal articles out of your, your PhD or your master's and convert them over. And that, that typically is a very slow process and people just don't want to look at their stuff anymore. And so it, a lot of research dies or doesn't get published or is left to the supervisors to have to do, which causes problems around intellectual property. Um, and then the pressure to publish and there's all these issues. Uh, because of that, um, at the PhD or master's dissertation or thesis level. So the workaround is uh, a more modern approach to the thesis, I would argue, is the thesis by publication. So basically what you have is you have your conclusion and your introduction, and then everything else in between is actually formatted and written as a journal article. So instead of your literature review just being a literature review that fits in the context of your thesis, it's like a published review that you might read in the journal. And then instead of a, a methods, you might do a reliability study and publish that in a specific journal. And then instead of having a big ass results section, you would have maybe three, four or five cross sectional, then acute and then longitudinal studies that are all aimed to answer the question. And they're all in your thesis as the journal article and like the pre-press version. Um, it does create a little bit of problems around uh, you know, you have to make sure that you have intellectual ownership of what you put in the thesis and who owns it as the journal publisher or you or the university. So there's some, some complexities around that. But it means that you get to publish as you go. You get experience publishing, being a corresponding author, getting the peer review process. Uh, and by the time you actually submit your thesis, not only have your supervisors um, or what's called your committee in the states looked it over and ensured that it actually is of a good quality, but it's gone through peer review as well through the journal process. So by the time you do your defense, you're much more confident that you have a, uh, a worthwhile uh, academic contribution to the field. It also changes a bit because of the two different systems in the way it, a, a thesis is examined. So in the English system, you have supervisors and in the States, you have a committee. In the States, your committee and your advisors are the ones who actually grade your thesis or your dissertation in the end. So not only are they helping you conduct your research and mentoring you, but they have to keep this certain kind of professional distance, and they should at least, because they're going to be the ones who decide whether or not you get your doctorate or your master's. It's not the same in the English system. You have supervisors who are much more in a mentoring partnership role because then it goes to external examiners at the end, people unattached to the university at the PhD level, uh, and at the master's level, one can be internal, but in a different department, someone you don't have a relationship with, who you only find out who they are a week before your defense, uh, who are selected by your supervisors, who then grade your PhD. So it gets sent off to them. They get a little uh, small payment as a thank you um, and like an honorarium. And then you, you, know, go to, you Skype with them uh, if they're outside the country, which they typically are and they, they, you do a defense, and then they, they tell you whether or not uh, you, you passed. So it, it creates a different relationship, and the kind of you and your supervisor's butts are all on the line at the end, versus your supervisors uh, or your committee in the States pushing you and letting you know the kind of the whole way of, no, you're not there yet. So that's why PhDs in the States can sometimes take 10 years. You've got like two years of classes, maybe three and then your committee is constantly telling you, look, no, that's not it. That's not it. Like, you know, the whole time. Um, and it may keep getting pushed back. You can take delays or, and then they eventually might cut you off and go, look, this isn't happening. Um, but in, uh, in, 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 in the English system, typically if people finish it, if they're going to finish it, it's three to three to five years tops. And most of the time, three or four. So anyway, the proposal stage. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be using that, 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 that modern format of thesis by publication. And there's a very logical kind of chain of steps that we typically do for, for a sports science PhD evaluating a question like I did. First, we need to know what's going on. So the first two chapters of my thesis were based around a systematic and then a narrative review of autoregulation. So the first one is a systematic review looking at autoregulation as a whole. Anything that we do that autoregulates quote unquote resistance training. So this goes beyond the use of RPE because we want to think about the big picture stuff here. And this is a really important point is that when I ask someone, hey, 
how do you train? And they say, oh, I auto regulate. That actually doesn't mean anything. Um, so setting the framework of going, look, RPE is not a system of training. It's simply a way of quantifying load that's individualized and takes into account that your performance changes on a day-to-day -day basis. You can use RPE in a linear periodization program. You can use RPE in a block periodized program. You can use RPE in a daily undulating program. You can use RPE in a block periodized program with week to week undulations. All these concepts are not mutually exclusive. And that's exactly the way I framed things up uh, to make sure that the, the reader understood that auto regulation is not a replacement for periodization, but it's the way that we individualize training, which is actually one of the tenets of exercise science theory and, and, and periodization, that it should be individualized. And, and you, know, you mentioned earlier that if you look at traditional articles on periodization, things are mapped out in a very pre-planned, top-down kind of organizational way. But I think that is largely a reflection of how you have to write for science. Right. Uh, not, and also that many of the roots of periodization came from the Russian system where their society was organized in a top-down way. You get sent away, you, yeah, to another place to yeah, train so all you your to, outside variables are controlled. Exactly. You go to a sports science, like you, you can get, you get a degree in powerlifting. You, yeah. you go to a sports science school, become... And then you, and then you athletes go to that school and become sportsmen, and they become master of their sport at a certain level. So it's very, very top down. Uh, the systems are built in. You're taught how to do it. Uh, it is empirically validated. You know all that stuff. But that is not how it was done, even though the literature was written that way in the English speaking world and in in the uh, democratic countries at the time in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, rather, it was all these individual coaches who were reading some of the sports science stuff, but not that much, and then letting things kind of emerge from what made sense on how they were getting their athletes, who were typically student athletes or amateur athletes in the States, right? And Canada and England and all that stuff. So that meant that there was a disconnect between the way research read when people were writing about linear periodization or undulating periodization or whatever, and this extends all the way to, to now. Uh, it reads like it's very rigid, but that's more a fact. That's more of the history of periodization and the way you have to write for science. But when it actually, when the rubber hits the road, you'll see that every good coach auto regulates. Yeah. Like if you talk to any S and C, whether he's familiar with RPE or not, he'll tell you, oh yeah, if they have a game on Saturday and their lower back's fried, and I had deadlifts planned, they're not doing deadlifts. That's <laughs> crazy. I'm going to change things, you yeah. know. And and so the concept of auto regulation of simply changing your own training—that's the auto part. Um, based on the current environment of your readiness or recovery, that's just known as good coaching in the <laughs> real world. So it's, it's not a novel concept at all. And there's many, many ways you can use to monitor an athlete to then decide what decisions to make. So in the systematic review, we looked at a ton of different monitoring systems. That's uh, like HRV. That could be performance, how high you can jump. Uh, that could be markers of muscle damage. That could be markers of stress. So taking bloods or saliva or hormones or uh, 1RM testing or submaximal testing, all this different di or, or questionnaires. So I did a big old review and, and then looked at correlations between training load and performance in each one of these monitoring factors. And then also touched on uh, the different methods of training that have autoregulation built into them, like velocity or RPE, and said, hey, here's where we need to do more research. And unsurprisingly, one of those fields was the usage of RPE to autoregulate. So that kind of built uh, the rationale of, hey, this is the little thread I'm going to follow. Yeah. The next review that I wrote was saying, hey, here's what we currently know about it. And it was basically a review of the study that Zerdos led, where they validated RPE using velocity, and the study by Hackett, where they had bodybuilders call out estimated reps to failure, built on the back of saying, hey, we saw that man came out and had these NCAA football players do better with APRE than traditional linear periodization. So, man, maybe we should we should keep going this direction. Here's what we currently know. By the way, Mike, Mike Tushir already wrote about this. It's being used in the field. Here's how they do it. And here's what percentage 1RM looks like at different RPEs and squats. Here's the preliminary data. And by the way, we need, we need more research on this. So that's the basically the start of my PhD. That's the, the literature reviews. Here's what already exists. Here's where the gaps are. And then I started systematically trying to answer each one of the questions. So I did uh, three short-term studies, uh, acute, like sing single 
one RM testing sessions was one of the studies, and then a uh, two 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 publications that came out of a three week study where people were using uh, RPE to auto regulate volume. So I could just say, hey, here's what happens if you use RPE stops or what are sometimes called fatigue percentages, and how much volume people get using power hypertrophy and strength training on different days in a randomized counterbalanced order. So we could just describe what happens. So for the first uh, three chapters after my two literature reviews were basically saying, hey, how good are, is, is, a, is, is a mock meet with someone using RPE? And how, you know, what, are, what, what's the RPE differences between a squat, a bench, and a deadlift when someone gets close to max? Um, are they, we actually calling 10 RPEs when we're at a 1RM? Uh, is the velocity going down in a predictable and strong way when you do that? Um, and then when we use RPE to modulate volume, does it actually predictably change volume? If we use larger back off percentages after a top RPE set, do we do more volume? Um, and then if a lifter says, I can do eight reps at eight RPE with 100 kilos, how accurate were they? How often did that end up actually being a seven or a six, or they get five reps instead of eight and hit failure, or they get 12 reps and yeah. something or something like that. And so I was able to report all those things, uh, their own perception of, of accuracy, like the RPE they thought they were going to get a given load versus the actual, uh, how much volume they got at when using volume auto regulation, and then how good max testing was when using RPE. And overall, we saw that in powerlifters, who is my target population, it's really, really good. I was incredulous, Eric, when I read that. Honestly, the how accurate powerlifters are with their RPEs. I'm like, these are the most self-aware powerlifters I've ever come across. If you go on the IG of people, it's like sub six. I'm like, that's clearly an RPE nine, bro. It's like these are these are some these are some intelligent, well-trained people. Where it was, I I when I read that, I'm like, huh. Like within, I think you quantified the amount of RP they're accurate to, and mm -hmm. they were bang on. Like these are these are some yeah. these are some people that know how to use the system, which is very cool. Yeah, and a big limitation of that as well is that if I ask you, hey, what can you do for eight reps at eight RPE? Yeah. The only way that we're going to know for sure that you were totally off is if you don't get eight reps. Yeah. Because if you get eight reps and you were thinking that would be an eight RPE, you could make the argument that that's a self fulfilling prophecy. That yes. goes, yeah, that was an eight, or that was a seven and a half, or that was eight and a half. You're now. So, so we, we don't have a way of validating that, that they couldn't have actually done four more reps when they said they could only do two more. Right. Um, but what they expected was what they got a lot. Um, now, fortunately, that, that, that's just a limitation of, of that study, that, that chapter of my PhD. We stated that very clearly. Yeah. And we've shored up that limitation in future research. So one of my students now, his name is Colby Sousa. He was Mike Zerdos' master student, and now he lives here in New Zealand. He's doing his PhD with me. Um, and some of the research that he was a part of, he, he did for his masters, he had lifters do the big three at 80% of one RM to failure. And then between reps, call that how many, they, how many reps they, 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 they think they had remaining. And on all three squat bench and deadlift, when you're doing 80% of one RM and train lifters, they're incredibly accurate. Yeah. We're talking within one rep. So that is something that even though it was, could be argued, oh, maybe they're not as accurate as they seem to be. We shored that up by using the actual fully going to failure and then calling out when you think you're at a you know a five a seven and a nine rpe mid set and yeah. found that no no they really are that accurate yeah so Co uh, it, was, it was reconfirmed so yeah just a, a real uh quick aside i basically was trying to indirectly say to a lot of ig uh, lifters out there there's a chasm between what they understand perhaps rpe to be just being you know I don't want to say more casual lifters, but in the context now of this research where I'm going to assume also they were instructed properly on RP, how to judge this and that, yes. like the, the definitions um, versus someone once again, because we're throwing out terms that most people listening to this, they're like, yeah, RP or like auto-regulate. It's like, I auto-regulate. And you said like, what does that even mean? So I think mm -hmm. in, in a way, I'm already seeing the utility of empowering individuals with the proper context of uh, the, this terminology and how to apply it. So you know, you're testing these subjects and they have a firmer understanding of also what RP is. And so as such, they could quantify it a little bit better in relation to their training or what you're giving them versus a bro online that's just like RP six. And you're like, okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a big difference between the social pressure of being on IG 
where you're attempting to get social approval yeah and the social pressure of volunteering for being given given informed consent and participating in a study where you're getting social approval for being accurate maybe yes. a little more conservative trying not to mess up the data yes. and contributing to science yeah. right so very consistently in the research what we see is that people if anything they slightly underestimate their rpe and the more trained they get the more accurate they are mm -hmm. like if you look at untrained individuals when they're in a research study when they call a 10 rpe <laughs> they might actually be at a six right <laughs> when you look at and then it, when you the, the higher training age you get the more that gap closes but you don't see anyone systematically under calling their rpe where they you know they hit that grinder on rg and they go yeah it was a seven like, that <laughs> yeah. was a nine and a half yeah yeah so it's it's very interesting that the perception if you were just to ask the average power lifter with an ig account you know <laughs> how good are powerlifters at rpe you'd say well real powerlifters are good at it but there's a lot of them who are just ego lifting and are always calling it one to two to three points below what it actually is but that never happens in the research it's a great takeaway man honestly from uh this episode here just that once again kind of the chasm between applied individuals who just to say uh quite frankly take their training more seriously or that process and have mm -hmm. more self-awareness first just like doing it for the gram yep yeah absolutely sorry so yeah the no no yeah so yeah the validity of rpe is something that in train lifters familiarized with rpe in a setting where they are trying to be accurate and I do think probably just even posting on, on Instagram is going to make you less accurate because you're now you're you're not just doing it for your own training improvement. Um, it, it, it's problematic. And I don't get nearly as many people who also do that when they're when I'm coaching them either. So when people send me videos because they've hired me to help them train better, they're trying to give me the best data. So the social approval they get from me is pleasing coach. Right. Yeah. So me constantly going, no, that was a seven. Quit being an ego lifter. It, it modifies their behavior uh, and it's different than, than that. So, so anyway, depending on the social context, you will see different accuracy ratings of, of calls. But on the whole, the research would suggest that train lifters familiarized with RPE are incredibly accurate, especially at high loads and at higher RPEs. The closer you get to failure, you're able to tell you're, you're closer to it. So when you're training at like say uh, five RPE or higher, you know, five reps in reserve or higher, and you're well trained, and you've done some training to failure. You're familiarized. You're going to be pretty accurate, um, which is cool. And that's that's what the broad research would show. So after these describing what the system does and, and validating it and showing that it is reliable, the final piece to the puzzle was me flying out to uh, to Florida, living there for for ten weeks, and conducting uh, a study along with the help of of all the students and the staff at uh, in, the, in the lab there. Uh, and that was my flagship study where we compared a percentage 1RM group to an RPE group. Uh, and we saw the same outcomes in terms of hypertrophy because no difference between the group, groups except how load was pres prescribed. Um, and uh, slightly better, but not significantly different. Um, so the effect size is favored uh, We're using magnitude-based inferences, which there are problems with. So um, the statistical model we use to assess which group got stronger, I would say is not the best model in retrospect as which we didn't know at the time there was right around the two years after my final study there was a big falling out with uh, in, the, in the sports science stats community as to the validity of the stats model we used as an adjunct to what we did so at the at the most conservative kind of interpretation of our data it is true that we had um, small effect sizes favoring uh, the group that uh, used the RPE, uh, but there was no p-value difference, so it wasn't striking results. And then we were, were looking at a group of 11 and a group of 10, so it wasn't a huge sample size. So it would best, I would say, preliminary uh, evidence that that perhaps RPE might be better for gaining strength. We saw better squat uh, and, and total uh, out of squat and bench. A subtotal is what they were doing. They were squat and bench training, favoring the RPE group. Now, the cool thing, though, is is that's the importance of doing this kind of research because no one else had compared to RPE to a percentage 1RM group is even though the findings were you know, not, not nothing to write home about in preliminary is now they get built on top of. And we just saw the first replication of my study come out just recently uh, where they gave, I think, front squats and I think it was yeah, basically a front squat based program or a squat program that they gave people to, to, to take home, do on their own and either run it with percentage 1RM or RPEs and then come back and be tested in the lab. 
And this time, the RPE group got significantly stronger, small effect sizes again favoring strength, and it largely replicated my findings. So now we have two studies showing that in trained lifters, RPE on average, and that does not mean for everyone, in fact, certain people would probably do better with percentages for uh, psychological ref reasons and pref personal preference and stress, but twice now, and both in my study and in this more recent study, we've seen RPE at the group level uh, beat out uh, percentage 1RM, which makes sense. You're able to put the load that's intended on the bar more often. So it's kind of all borne out in that, yeah, there's something here, uh, and small changes can make big competitive differences in high-level lifters. Uh, you know, if, 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 you know, if you think about it, like Usain Bolt, like he's, he's the fastest man in the world, but... The guys in second and third behind him, they're fractions of, of, a, of distances away. And there's some time in the year where they could beat him and vice versa. So the the marginal gains that, that really don't seem to matter for, you know, general population strength levels. Like, I, it doesn't matter if, you, if, you, if you've got a, uh, let's say... 460 a, squat first. Yeah. Yeah, like, or, or just like in a clinical setting. Like, you're doing a rehab program for people who are recovering from... Uh, you know, musculoskeletal issues. And do you, should you use RPE or percentage 1RM? It doesn't matter. Like if they're lifting weights, it's really important. If they're using the right biomechanics and the right movements and the right dosage and the right rate of response, great. But if we're talking about, yeah, I, I want, like you said, I want to go from a 460 squat to a 500 squat. Um, RPE might get you there a few months earlier, right? On average and not for everyone, but it's, it's, it's one of those tools, exactly. It's for someone who is well-trained and is trying to get more well-trained or to use a scientific term. Yeah, what, just like your uh, title of your thesis, what's auto-regulation? What's the dealio? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's something I say all, all the time <laughs> when, I, when I meet up with researchers who are doing like important <laughs> research for the world. I'm like, uh, you know, sure, I guess you're helping with cancer cachexia or, or you're, you're, you know, you're helping with diabetes research, but I'm doing the important work of making jacked people even more jacked. Yeah. So, yeah. So just yeah. think about that. And, uh, uh coach, yeah. I don't know if you saw for those that don't have video, I took out uh, one, uh, earbud about 30 minutes ago. I just wanted to update us as we continue this journey, you're a PhD, uh, a journey for the iron cult sure that you proposed the mm -hmm. movie idea with um tom hanks we can't get tom uh he is actually vehemently opposed to the idea just so you know but we can and he is absolutely willing adam sandler would love Done. to adapt it into a uh feature film he said he called it a feature film and he said film not yeah. movie he hates when people call them movies because that implies that they're not serious it's he wants to get serious feature film iron cult we got Sam. Netflix only release. I'm down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's shovel. Let's do it. Yeah, shovel bear. So, <laughs> back back to contributing greater good to humanity in the form of making people more jacked and stronger. RPE in individuals that do want to. When you said understanding the context of this, that it might improve fractionally uh, performance. Mm -hmm. But for those that care about this, this is very important. Just a, a great example of Usain Bolt where, yeah, you say, oh, this might improve it one or two percentages if you're using percentages or whatever. And you might think to yourself, that doesn't sound like a lot. But when you think that Usain Bolt, the difference between first and second is point, you know, one five of a second, that's huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yep. So, so that 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 was that's basically my PhD in a you know hour and a half long nutshell. So easy. Yeah, it's uh you know what I uh I don't even think it was that long. Uh, a coach. I'm good. Did. It just felt that long of talking no. about it. So no, because normally we have uh, there's banter back and forth. You're on a roll. Um, I actually think you pulled a Will Ferrell uh, to use another great movie reference in old school, where because you're currently dieting. <laughs> You actually summoned everything within you to give a very clear and in-depth uh, in-depth overview of your PhD process and what it actually means, various definitions, the history of autoregulation, RP, how in fact people do use it and they don't know the terminology, the gap between uh, literature or the scientific method and then what coaches actually do, why you decided to do, how you carried it out, how it's different between uh, you know uh, it, the English or European uh, school versus American and uh, Canadian, and then the utility of it to sh uh, show everyone, damn it, Okay, it's still important to me. You're doing cancer research. Good on you. I just showed RP. Pretty cool tool. All right, come on, guys. Let's go. 
give me a, give me a break here. Yeah, exactly. Hey, well, so, thanks, man. But in retrospect, so now you've had mm. what is it? Is it, is it uh, was it twenty eighteen as published or was it twenty? Yeah, so I graduate. So there's just like three finishes to PhDs. Okay. There's a <laughs> there's so I submitted my thesis in I want to say March or April twenty seventeen. Um, then I defended my thesis I want to say in August, um, early August or late July, somewhere in there. And then I graduated. Actually, walked the stage and officially became. I went from being a graduand to a graduate uh, of my PhD when I officially was graduated in December 2017. Okay. So it's been just about a year and a half. Nice. And uh, to ask the question, so you said how you used um, uh, some of the statistics looking back on this thesis. Not if you could change anything, but I, I want to talk actually now that you've shown via uh, this thesis and has actually been replicated one of the studies. What's the future? What, what would you like to see mm. done? Because you've contributed. We can, we can say... Sandler's in. Uh, what is the future then for auto regulation in RPE now that you've done some research? Or what would you like to yeah. see? Yeah, what I would really like to see is more investigation of individual differences in personality so we can get an idea of, because I think it's science will often pigeonhole itself just because of the nature of quantitative research is that we take two things, change one, we take one thing, change one variable, and then compare it. Uh, or we compare two distinct systems and we don't speculate as to what the mechanism is. We just know that A is better than B. But it always gives this kind of black or white uh, perception. It puts it on, on this, this, this concept scale that you have to choose one or the other. It's either percentage one or M or it's RPE. Right. When I actually program in the real, real world, I like to program with both. I'll be like, I want you to do three by eight at 70%. And by the way, that first set should be between a six to eight RPE. And if it's not, then you modify the next set. Uh, and that helps someone know where to start and then gets them closer to it. Um, and it's not just three by eight at six to eight RPE, which you can do. There's nothing wrong with that, but they can be the strengths and the, and the weaknesses of each can be combined so that you minimize uh, the weaknesses and maximize the strengths. And I think that's really, that's one thing is that uh, we, we don't want to look at it as auto regulation versus not. Uh, and we also don't want to assume that just because of the group level, it could be better for, for powerlifters or strength athletes, that it's better for every powerlifter or strength athlete. Right. For example, my most successful client, Bryce Lewis, primarily doesn't use RPE. He does, that's not actually true. We use it in some places. But I would say for the most part of his career and on most of his lifts, we're using a percentage one around. Um, and you tied that kind of back maybe to personality a little bit is being one of the variables. Yeah, correct. So if, if, if the aspect of constantly rating your own performance leads to, say, negative self-talk, doubt, additional stress, um, or if you're an emotional lifter and that's actually something you've, you've gotten to the point where it benefits your arousal level and being too cere cerebral takes you out of that and your performance suffers, um, or if, you know, let's say you have a high level of neuroticism, if we were to think about the, the big five character traits, and it really, really fuels that too much and you get too, too OCD and that ends up negatively affecting kind of the rest of your life or, or your enjoyment of training, your adherence, et cetera. I, I've seen a number of different times where I, I can see it being problematic. You know, I'd have some studies or some, some participants in the studies where I would have to tell them, I need you to give me this, this RPE value within the next two minutes because you only have a three to five minute rest interval. And they'd be hemming and hawing over whether it was a seven, seven and a half or an eight RPE. Um, and I think if, if it's creating that much stress, is it worth it? You know, and I want it to be much more of a kind of a, a, a one-off assessment of, all right, how did that feel? And some people just really don't, they're not quote unquote feelers. They're more thinkers and judgers and they're very analytical and they are both, they will both sometimes like that they have something else to analyze and get a number but also be stressed out by the process and whether or not their their perception was valid because they like hard data. So yeah. there are certain combinations of personality types, thinking, relationships with lifting, arousal states, experience levels that I think don't lend themselves towards using RPE. And I'd like to know what that is, if it's trainable, if it changes, how to predict it beforehand. Uh, right now, I basically just try it out and if someone hates it and they're not getting better at it or if the cost of getting better at it isn't worth it, yeah. then we don't do it. And there's workarounds, you know, to 
figure out what someone's specific ability at different percentages are and then give them rep ranges. There's a lot of ways to, to work around not using RPE. So the future for me is to get a better idea of who's the tool better for, uh, I think, and, and how do we integrate it better with other systems. I got you. Yeah, it, uh, it's fascinating that in the realm of training has actually proven the greatest refutation of uh, Ben Shapiro's statement of facts over feelings. We're actually here. Feelings very much matter. And uh, Mike Tashir, I love that phrase that he said for those that may have listened to episode four or have not where he said the biopsychosocial feedback of everything. And his his definition of training, where you just said, you know, I, I view him as a very cerebral thinker, where he has, he's think it's multi-layered what he's thinking about, really informs then how you organize your lifting and how you perform and how you should think about these things, where his, his definition of periodization and then auto-regulation about the cave, a cave mm. and you don't, you can't illuminate the cave. You're trapped, you're trapped in a cave. This is just a paraphrase of what he said. You're basically, you're in a cave, you're in a cave. You want to get out. It's completely dark. The uh, rocks are moving around. So nothing's stationary. They're constantly changing. And that is the biopsychosocial feedback of like how you feel, mm -hmm. your environment, all that shit. And then you can never illuminate it with, you know, a lantern or a big light. You have a little pen light, which is, once again, the feedback and the regulation that you're doing. And then the map is your training program and you're constantly adjusting it with the pen light, trying to get out of there as all the rocks are moving constantly and you're trapped once again in a cave. I'm like, that, Mike, that's lovely, bro. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it explains why we get so many frustrated questions online. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I thought it was interesting how you had a couple considerations for your uh, thesis, what you wanted to do, right? Where uh, Mike Tashir, auto regulation, uh, and, and talking about RP and the role when it comes to powerlifting was one. Uh, equally valid, but maybe harder to research would have been taking a look at Westside, um, their training philosophy of. Uh, if you're not lifting it, just up the trend. I'm like, I don't know if you can get government grants for that. So mm. you, you, you decided to go with the, sh the sure route of RP and quantifying that noble as always, Eric, would you, <laughs> anything you wanted to add to that? <laughs> just laughing. <laughs> you're, like, you're like, how do I not respond to any of this by keeping a neutral position uh, with everything that Omar has said, all these inflammatory <laughs> statements that Omar is consistently making. Um, no, my, my question would be for you now doing this entire process. So it was, uh, mm. was it four years since, uh, the inception about, about four years, your PhD? Yes. Yeah, so it was a little closer to three, like three. three, three, three years, I think three months or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Three years, three months and 21 days. What do I know? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, anything, not that you would do uh, differently, but now that you've walked everyone through and there are people, you know, we get on the iron culture, Instagram. DMs of people and I take a look, it's like, you know, they, they have their master's, uh, maybe they have a degree in kinesiology. These are, there's a good portion of people that care about furthering their education. And you began um, <laughs> this discussion by saying for the practitioner that wants to train clients, how you don't view it as being necessary to focus on a discipline to that extent, getting a PhD, but to those listening out there that are perhaps interested in the process from you going through it, any advice you'd give to hopeful individuals out there that want to make that impact, you know, like, like, sorry, cancer research, you're not cool. Let's RP getting more swole. I'm in like, what advice would you give from now going through the process? Well, I like the way you frame that, that it's like, uh, if people want to give back, if they want to do research and I think way too many people look at, and I understand why they do it at the, um, undergraduate level because it's their first foray into the workforce. And the undergraduate degree is pitched, sold, and very much can have an impact on what 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 job you can get. Um, but at the graduate level, it is not about what are you getting from your degree. Is what is you get, what are you giving? Um, of course, you do get something out of it. But if you're asking what jobs and what career can I get by getting a master's or a PhD, and if that's your primary concern, that will lead you to have a more likely negative experience, um, potentially be disappointed, uh, and it won't sustain you through the kind of long-term commitment it is to a singular topic. You know, a bachelor's degree is a long-term commitment. It's three or four years, just like a PhD, but it is multiple classes, different topics. You get the variety thing. You can change your major, um, and if you drop out, 
it is what it is, but dropping out when you've done, when you're starting on something momentum, momentous and one big project like a PhD or a master's, it is much more emotionally traumatic from what I've seen among people who have dropped out because it becomes your baby. Um, and just like raising a child, you want to do it from a place of love and the process in every moment is something that I'm assuming I'm not a parent, but um, it's not your, your goal of raising a child isn't just to think about, all right, well, when they're 18, I want them to be, you know, a good contributing member of society and whatever. I'm not too focused on this whole like first time they talk or first time they walk or their first, you know, girlfriend or whatever, like screw that. I just want to make sure that come 18, they're out there and they're productive member of society. And I think that's how people approach degrees. They, they, they think the process is what they have to do to get the piece of paper and they want to know how it can get them a job. But I think if you're going to do graduate education, you have to be thinking about two things. How do I make meaning out of this? What is the process of, 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 of accruing knowledge and doing a deep dive on something regardless of the topic has intrinsic value. The pursuit of knowledge makes me a more complete person. It helps me understand the world around me. You know, through mastery of one thing, one thing, better understanding of all. Um, th through that deep dive process, you understand that there's complexity in all things, as silly as, you know, powerlifting or bodybuilding. Uh, there, there is complexity if you wish to seek it out. And that teaches you about life in general. It teaches you about yourself. Um, and it teaches you about stick, stick to itiveness and keeping the goal the goal uh, and overcoming challenges um, and having to adjust as your plan doesn't survive contact with the enemy in real life. Um, and I think the process is incredibly important. The pursuit of knowledge is incredibly important. And then the second piece is contributing. So instead of seeing what you can extract from, from a degree program, um, you are seeing what can I do to further a field? What can I do to contribute knowledge in even some small way? So that's the mindset someone needs to have into doing a master's or a PhD, that this has intrinsic value. I don't need to get something out of it. It's not a requirement. It's not for my CV. It doesn't make it uh, like, like those are all nice side effects. But I think how we talked about the layered cake of motivation with it being, you know, enjoying the process, self-improvement, and then, you know, winning a pro card or whatever, if we're talking about a bodybuilder, it needs to be, uh, enjoying the process and giving back to the community. Huge. Uh, and then and then the next layers are all of those second order effects of, oh, and I also have a PhD now. I can, now I'm allowed to, to do this or that, or people ask me things or it furthers my career. Uh, and those things are, are certainly worthwhile, but those external outcomes I think are uh, not enough to sustain someone through the process because it is very difficult to commit to something for that time period that has a high academic standard and is difficult. So that, that's my advice to anyone is, is do it for the love. Yeah. Follow your passion. Um, whatever topic you choose, you need to be 100% motivated about it because after three to four years or longer, that is going to drop a solid 20, 30%. So you need to not fall below like that C minus. You yeah. know, like if you fall below 50 to 70% passion about a project, you won't finish it. So you need to be annoyingly excited about it at the start because by the end, you're going to be like, eh. That's someone, someone asked you, Eric, in your third year. So, uh, Eric, do you think uh, RPE is a valid uh, tool in auto regulation for, uh, you know, a lifter interested in powerlifting? And your response was just, I don't care. <laughs> it's like, ooh, <laughs> yeah. he's too deep in this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it really does get like that where it can become quite the, the slog. And if you remember why you did it, then you can appreciate that. And the harder you end up working towards something and the more pain and effort you put into it, the greater the, the feeling of accomplishment at the end. But not if you forget why you're doing it. And if you're just like, yeah, all I got was this piece of paper and I put all this work into it, then it's just like this double slap in the face. But that's really totally dependent on how you see it. Yeah. And if you make uh, the slog a, a personal affront against you uh, to get something that doesn't even matter, then yeah, it's going to be shitty. But if that is the the process of self-betterment and the the effort you put forth to hopefully make the world a better place and enhance knowledge, then man, that can be really, really rewarding. And it's something you can you can have pride in. Woke Helms. Okay, people talk about aesthetics. The aesthetic, okay, you going through this discipline, you have out Will Ferrell'd yourself, my friend, with this uh, episode, I think, because we seamlessly combined your PhD journey alongside explaining what the actual thesis was of auto-regulation in RP with powerlifting. So it was both at the same time, 
landed perfectly. We're never off time. We're just syncopated enough to get right there with everyone. Is there anything that you want to add? You see, I'm, I'm basically pulling the Iron Culture format on your ass, where it's like we, we wrapped it up in a nice bow tie, and this is now Eric being ever so gracious with the guests. Anything, uh, Eric, you want to add that you feel that we missed out or anything else you want to clarify uh, based upon what we talked about? No, man, I think we did a really good job. You did an excellent job nope. hosting this. Nope. And I want to thank you for having me on Iron Culture. <laughs> hey, Eric, where can people find you? Well, you, if you want to learn more about me and what I do, you can check me out on Iron Culture Podcast. <laughs> right, right. Um, that's with my co-host, uh, Omar Issa, where we generally have good guests, but sometimes we just let... <laughs> we don't have guests. ...monologue for an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. Tune in next week where I force Eric to get another PhD in the span of a week so we have another episode to discuss. Don't worry, we can talk about my master's. I'm sure everyone's very excited to hear another one of these. <laughs> no, I so I am informing now what we say self fulfilling prophecy. Like I'm telling people this is a great episode. I actually I found it compelling. I thought your flow was very good. Um, honestly, combining those two, uh, they're they are intertwined. The journey along with dropping the knowledge on actually auto regulation. I think it's cool because people don't see. That's a, when I said initially. Um people don't see the amount of work and there is that Michelangelo quote where people uh, someone was taking a look at the work on the wall of his and admiring it saying how it was masterful and he stated if only you could see the amount of hours that I spent coming up with this that mm. it's not it's, it's not from thin air and so the concept is that you know we can and I joke because I come from that segment of the Google scholars of where we're trying to find out a certain level of information but the intellectual then humility that you bring going through this process where there are people that'll jump too early or just even on Instagram once again it was kind of amusing where uh, I did I wasn't questioning at all uh, when I mentioned how accurate the powerlifters were, were with RP, it's more like these are serious lifters that you recruit, both that maybe you recruited, but also that then you inform them what RP is versus kind of mm -hmm. like Instagram, like it's, it's RP6, you already know. It's like you're way off. Um, so I found it fascinating. I want to just thank everyone for listening to this episode of Iron Culture Podcast, Iron Culture, uh, the podcast. Probably, honestly, with the numerous production delays that occur in Hollywood. It's going to be one of those projects with Adam Sandler where it's scheduled to be released summer 2021, but he's no longer relevant. So it'll probably be on Netflix, but let's face it. Netflix is featuring uh, stiff competition from Amazon prime and Hulu and other services, streaming services. So it'll probably be in development hell. Um, but when it's released, Iron Colt, everyone will love it. I want to thank mm. Eric for being on being the guest and the co-host of this uh, episode everyone can uh do us a favor and we do read them and eric actually uh, does two on when we post on uh iron culture the instagram and so forth a rating review on itunes was very heartwarming where people uh say and i can say that doing this podcast has been very fulfilling so go ahead leave a rating review on youtube if you like it you can leave a like if you dislike it that's totally fine i mean eric will take that very personally because he's pouring it will his, hurt my feelings his heart and soul he just spent share with you three years of his life trying to improve humanity and you're just going to dislike the video whack uh, but you can if that's what you want and we'll see everyone in that next episode on monday